Good evening, everyone. Uh, 1922, uh, the year of the centenary of F.W. Murnau's deathless film, Nosferatu. Uh, it was, of course, the year that Ezra Pound called year one of the modern era, the year of James Joyce's Ulysses in February and T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland in October, as well as Ezra Pound's poetry and so on. And you've been hearing about some aspects of this centenary of the year 1922 throughout this series. So how does, how does Murnau's film, how does Nosferatu fit into year one of the modern era? It, well, it opened on the 4th of March, 1922, just after the publication of Ulysses at the great marble hall of Berlin's Zoological Society, where else? And, and so it, it is indeed a centenary this year. So where does it all fit in? How does it fit together? I want to start with a bit of a surprise with two quotations, one from James Joyce's Ulysses and one from T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. This is, from, this is from Ulysses. He comes pale vampire through storm his eyes, his bat sails bloodying the sea, mouth to her mouth's kiss. Here, tablets, my tablets, mouth to her kiss. Okay, that's a little quote from Ulysses. It's a direct reference to Dracula by Bram Stoker, published in 1897, uh, a reference to Dracula's ship sailing into Whitby with its uh, uh, bat sails bloodying the sea as the Count arrives in England, and also tablets, the reference to Jonathan Harker sitting in Castle Dracula, writing, tablets, my tablets, tis meat, I set it down, a, a quotation, actually a misquotation, but a quotation from Hamlet. So James Joyce is writing about his fellow Irishman, Bram Stoker. And here's The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, published in October, 1922. A woman drew her long black hair out tight and fiddled whisper music on those strings and bats with baby faces in the violet light whistled and beat their wings and crawled head downward down a blackened wall and upside down in air were towers, tolling reminiscent bells that kept the hours and voices singing out of empty cisterns and exhausted wells. <coughs> Excuse me. A direct reference to the moment in Bram Stoker's Dracula, where the Count crawls face downwards with his cloak billowing as if he's a bat uh, down the walls of Castle Dracula. And bats with baby faces in the violet light crawled head downward down a blackened wall. The point is that both Ulysses and the Wasteland refer to Dracula to Bram Stoker's novel. So this isn't about high and low, high culture being T.S. Eliot and Joyce and Pound and low culture being the movies. It's a kind of continuum and that's part of 1922. So I'm gonna list a few things where I think it fits in with year one of the modern era. The, um, there's been of course a lot of research on the connections between the artists of the modern era and the artists of 1922 and mysticism, secret societies, the occult, esoteric. Uh, Yeats and the Golden Dawn, uh, Mondrian and Theosophy, and the attraction that a lot of these modernists felt for esoteric or occult religions. Well, where, where uh, Murnau's film is concerned, the three main protagonists <clears throat> all had deep connections with the occult. The producer and graphic designer, Albin Grau uh, was a well-known occultist in Germany. He was a pan-sophist. In fact, he was in charge of uh, a large group of pan-sophists. Henrik Gallin, the scriptwriter, was a well-known Rosicrucian. And F.W. Murnau, Friedrich Murnau, was also known at the time to be fascinated with the occult. So they called their production company Prana Film, which means the breath of life. And they chose as their logo the yin and the yang uh, of um, Eastern mysticism. And you'll notice in the film Nosferatu that the character of Bulva, Bulva, the, the Van Helsing character, uh, is a, a Paracelsist, is an occultist, and there are countless documents in this film absolutely covered with Kabbalistic singles, symbols, which would have meant an awful lot to uh, these three occultists who were deeply involved. One of the things about Nosferatu that makes it particularly creepy is that it is quite evident that everyone involved actually believed in vampires. Usually vampire movies take a distance from the subject. They put them in quotation marks, they're ironic. This is full face 
it's an evil that has to be confronted. So that's one way in which it fits in, I think, with the modern movement. Secondly, Nosferatu set the tone for a new kind of cinematic horror in a very rapidly developing technology in the 1920s. It's a film which begins with a shot with a telescopic lens, a focal length of 75 from inside the tower of St. Mary's Church, Wismar. And it included all sorts of techniques that were very new to cinema, stop motion for the arrival of Count Orlok's carriage, a reversal of negative and positive for the White Forest, cross-cutting between four separate scenes as the ship arrives carrying Count Orlok's coffin and we get the beach and we get uh, the heroine sleepwalking and, they, they, uh, and Jonathan Harker escaping and all of them were cross-cut in, in a fairly avant-garde way. Remember that collage and montage were very much modernist inventions and they play a very important role in this film. So although the film may be set in 1838, it makes full use of the latest technology and that I think fits it in with the modern movement as well. When the film opened in the Marble Hall at Berlin's Zoological Society, uh, guests at the preview were requested to dress up in festive costume, as for the invitation said, come to the Nosferatu Grand Ball, a Biedermeier costume, i.e. costumes from the period 1815 to 1848. Uh, to match the historical setting of the film and create a suitably retro setting for a retro atmosphere for the evening of the premiere. So everyone's dressed up in costumes that relate to this and having a wonderful time. So ladies and gentlemen, what you're watching is the invention of cosplay. People think that it all started with the Rocky Horror Show. It didn't. It started with the premiere of Nosferatu. Uh, fourthly, it's also been called the first cult film worthy of the name. And this relates to one of the intertitles in a, a version of the film. And it's one of the most beautiful intertitles in the whole of silent cinema. It's when the Jonathan Harker figure, Hutter, is first met by the coach and horses on his way to Count Orlok's remote castle. And in the French print of 1926, the intertitle in English reads, and when he crossed the bridge, the phantoms came to meet him. Uh, Passé le pont, les phantoms vinrent à sa rencontre. That was the French version of 1926. The original German version had been much more prosaic. No sooner had Hutter stepped across the bridge than uncanny visions seized hold of him. But in the French one, and when he crossed the bridge, the phantoms came to meet him. Well, various surrealist artists went to see the film in Paris in 1926 and delightedly adopted the intertitle as one of their catchphrases, as their mantra. In fact, Andre Breton, the great surrealist artist called it, quote, the sentence I have never been able to see without a mixture of joy and terror. So crossing the bridge for surrealists in mid twenties Paris became shorthand for entering a parallel universe of phantoms, dreams, transgressions and nightmares. Surrealists went to see the film over and over again and intoned the phrase as a mantra when it appeared on the screen as if it was part of some dark liturgy. So not only was this the first cosplay film, it was the first cult film worthy of the name. A real cult with surrealists sitting in the stalls, intoning, and when he crossed the bridge, the phantoms came to meet him. And of course, fifthly, it was modern because it founded a genre which is very much still with us. Not just the genre of vampire cinema, but in some ways, uh, the whole of the modern horror movie. And of course, it contains some of the most memorable shots in the whole of silent cinema. I'm sure you've seen them as stills. The shadow on the wall uh, or as the vampire climbs the stairs on the way to Ellen's bedroom. Now, vampires aren't supposed to cast shadows, but what the hell, it makes a great sequence. Uh, the ship, the Empusa, gliding into harbor, bringing Count Orlok and his coffin and the rats. And as it glides into the harbor, you'll notice the ship sails obliterate the cathedral. It's a very, very beautiful moment. Uh, Nosferatu setting up his coffin on the ship uh, and, uh, uh, and all sorts of moments which are indelible and make great stills as well. So was this the first vampire movie? Well, there had been quite a few films, 41 by my reckoning, between 1896 and 1922, which had the word vampire in the title. And this has led to all sorts of speculation about what the films might have been because some of them are lost, most of them are American. And uh, um, I think it's fair to say that nobody has found 
a film between 1896 and 1922 where the vampire is a supernatural creature. The vampire is a vamp, a femme fatale, or a member of a criminal fraternity, like in the French serial Les Vampires of the early 1920s by Feuillard with Moussi Dora as Irma Vep. Uh, and, and so a criminal, a femme fatale, a vamp, and that seems to be the, uh, the archetypal vampire of pre-1922. Epitomized by the film 1915, called A Fool There Was with Fida Vara, silent film actress, uh, whose real name was Theodosia Goodman, who changed her name <coughs> to Theda Vara, which is an anagram of Arab death, and became absolutely well known in Hollywood for portraying vamps. And a fool there was, she plays this vampish lady who seduces a diplomat on a ship across the Atlantic. And uh, she has this famous line, which went into movie mythology, kiss me, my fool, but she's a vamp. She's not supernatural, she doesn't bite people. <laughs> Um, there was a film made in the year before Nosferatu called Dracula's Death in Hungary, and people have speculated that this might be uh, a vampire film based upon a, 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 an unauthorised version of Bram Stoker's novel Dracula. In fact, the novelization has turned up and the latest researches show that it's actually about a woman incarcerated in a lunatic asylum, as they used to be called, who's being gaslighted by another inmate who thinks that he's Count Dracula. Complicated, but it's called The Death of Dracula. It was co-written by Michael Curtiz, who went to Hollywood and became a famous director, and it has nothing to do with supernatural vampires. So I think it's fair to say that 1922, that uh, Nosferatu was uh, the first film to be uh, a card-carrying vampire, uh, a, a vampire worthy of the name. Dracula, of course, was published in 1897. It was translated into German in 1908, where it became a bestseller and was reissued in 1920. And I suspect it was the reissue in 1920 that uh, uh, gave them the idea to make Nosferatu. It was unauthorized. They never cleared the copyright. So uh, how did the adaptation occur? Well, it was filmed between July and October 1921 in Lubeck and Wismar, standing in for Visborg, and in Slovakia, where the ruined castle was and the interiors were at a studio in Berlin. And the scriptwriter, uh, Galin, and the director, Monau, evidently reckoned that by transposing the story of Dracula back to 1838, instead of 1897, removing all the 1897 techno references in the novel to the latest technology, typewriters, blood transfusions, recording devices, Winchester rifles, etc., and substituting pre-industrial references to superstition, and the occult, altering the names of all the main characters and all the locations where the action takes place. But if they did all that, maybe their piracy of Bram Stoker's novel might not be noticed. After all, Dracula wasn't nearly as well known as it is today because it had never been made into a film before. Uh, actually, Murnau had form. He, the previous year, he'd made a film called uh, Janus Kopf, The Janus Head, which was an unauthorized version of Robert Louis Stevenson's story, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So he'd already made a, a Gothic story without, without the property being cleared. So Harker in Nosferatu becomes Hutter, Mina becomes Ellen, Dracula becomes Graf Orlok, Count Orlok, Van Helsing becomes Bulva, and Renfield, the fly eating eater, a fly eater, becomes a crazed estate agent called Nock. Whitby became Bismar, and most of the story now took place in Germany. And three new elements were added to vampire law, none of which were from Bram Stoker's novel. And they appear to have been invented or derived from folklore and fairy tale, especially for this movie. The first, that vampires are destroyed by exposure to the light of dawn. Now we all recognize in Hammer films and elsewhere, the, the great scene where Dracula disintegrates when Van Helsing opens the, the castle curtains. Well, the idea that vampires are disintegrate when exposed to the light of dawn starts with this movie. In Dracula, the novel, the Count wanders around Piccadilly in broad daylight with no difficulty at all. He's not at his best, <laughs> he's best at night, but it doesn't destroy him. So that's number one. Uh, secondly, that vampires are vulnerable to a quote, chaste woman who is prepared fearlessly to sacrifice herself and keep him occupied until the, the, the break of dawn, like the character center in The Flying Dutchman. That was invented for Nosferatu. And thirdly, and probably most importantly, that vampires bring the plague with them. 
carried by coffin rats when they sweep into a new territory. In fact, vampires, to judge by Max Schreck's performance as Nosferatu, may even resemble rats. They have pointy ears, staring eyes, rodent teeth, and claw-like nails. And if you look very closely, very creepy touch, the claw-like nails grow throughout this movie. Uh, they get longer and longer as the film progresses. I think the plague element must particularly have struck a chord with audiences who'd recently survived the Spanish flu pandemic, uh, which uh, ran from 1918 to 1919, actually it originated in America rather than Spain, but it was known as Spanish flu. And it had killed many more people than all the battlefields and trenches of the First World War. So the people who came to see the film in March 1922 were survivors of the Spanish flu pandemic. In the film, the town of Wismar goes into total lockdown with a local official chalking up white crosses on the doors of households whose inhabitants have died following infection by the virus Vampiricus. So the equation vampire equals plague begins here. And in time, it was become a staple of the genre. And you can imagine how much of a punch it must have packed when people saw this in 1922. It's very interesting that Murnau's script has in fact been published uh, in a book by Lotta Eisner, published in the 1960s about F.W. Murnau, and it's annotated in his own handwriting. And the original script is much more explicitly about Dracula, uh, much nearer to the novel, than the finished film. So for example, it says on the title page, a script based on the novel Dracula by Bram Stoker and freely adapted by Henrik Galin. Uh, and uh, it talks about going to England from Transylvania. It talks about Whitby. It talks about going from Varna to Whitby. It talks about the ship called the Demeter, which is the name of the ship in the novel, whereas in the film, it's the Empusa. So something happened between the writing of the script and the making of the film that encouraged them not to clear the copyright and uh, thereby hangs a tale. Mrs. Florence Bram Stoker, age 64, uh, Bram Stoker's widow, he died in 1912, uh, wasn't very well off. Most of Bram Stoker's books weren't in print and Dracula was her one meal ticket. So when she got to hear about the film, she saw some of the publicity. Uh, Prana, the film company, spent as much on publicity as they did on actually shooting the film and uh, beautiful posters and press books and so on. Anyway, it came to her attention and she's trying to get legal redress for breach of copyright from the company Prana Film, which immediately went into receivership, declared bankruptcy a couple of months after completing Nosferatu. So she had to deal with the receivers with the loss adjusters and she took it through the German courts. And after a couple of years of delaying tactics and complicated legal uh, technicalities, uh, 1922 to 1925, the German court settled by saying that all prints, positive and negative, of Nosferatu should be destroyed. And that was at least some satisfaction because, as uh, Mrs. Bram Stoker said, uh, its mere existence prejudiced the, my dramatization and film rights. I mean, she was currently trying to negotiate both theatrical rights and film rights, and she felt the mere existence of prints of Nosferatu prejudiced her position. So the court rules that the film should be destroyed. Then it appeared in France. Well, it appeared in 1926, the print that Surrealists went to see. It appeared in London in December 1928. It was shown at the London Film Society, where on the poster it was billed as Murnau's Dracula. And underneath it said, Film Society shows pirated version, almost showing off the fact that this was a bootleg production. And uh, uh, Sto uh, Mrs. Stoker's lawyers got in touch with the Film Society and very reluctantly, Ivor Montague, the founder of the Film Society had to surrender the print and it was destroyed, 1928. And then it showed up in New York, the Film Guild Cinema on West 8th Street, uh, billed as Nosferatu the Vampire, inspired by Dracula. And again, the lawyers got in touch with them and uh, forced them to uh, release their print and hand it over to Universal Studios for destruction. It was handed over uh, in March of 1930, and uh, three weeks later, they started filming their version with Bela Lugosi. Uh, they didn't actually destroy their print. Uh, they kept it for a year or two, but, but that, that's another story. And then a sound version appeared in 1930 in Germany called The Twelfth Hour which was a version of Nosferatu with lots of extra footage of happy peasants in the fields. 
And by transposing the early scenes of the film to the end, they made it look as though it had a happy ending with Hutta and his girlfriend wandering around the, the, the garden. The, uh, the prints that uh, uh, survived this process, this is, this is quite complicated, but it's interesting. The prints, I mean, most of us saw Nosferatu in beaten up, I saw it in Bristol actually, in a beaten up print in the 1970s. Um, one print, one good print survived, a Czech export print survived. And in 1940, it was acquired by the Cinematheque in Paris. And that was the version that was acquired by MoMA, a copy in 1947, uh, the, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, a Czech export print. A second print turned up in Germany, which has the intertitles in their original calligraphy. So uh, that was a, a safety copy. And thirdly, a copy of the sound version survived. So the version that you see today in restoration is a mixture of this Czech export print intertitles as from the German print with, a, with one or two editions from this unauthorized sound version. Sorry, it's such a complicated story, but uh, anyway, um, Universal's given a copy and they begin filming their version uh, shortly afterwards. So it's a, it's a strange thing. It's, a, uh, it's probably the most productive act of piracy in the history of mass media because on the basis of them ignoring copyright and going ahead with it, and on the basis of the fact that a print survived to be restored and watched and turned into a classic, this film has had its huge impact. It must have particularly irked Mrs. Stoker that Prana Film spent so much on publicity on the wonderful posters designed by Alvin Grau, who was the producer and graphic designer of the film. Well, the advanced publicity teased and dared the audience to buy a ticket. It said this, Nosferatu who cannot die. A million fancies strike you when you hear the name. Nosferatu, Nosferatu does not die. And so the marketing of this, again, it founded the ballyhoo of the marketing of vampire films, which always had a much to do with carnival style promotional gimmicks as it did with the film itself. Yet another tradition. I say finally, Pauline Kael, the critic, wrote of Nosferatu, absolutely wisely, I think, the first important film of the vampire genre has more spectral atmosphere, more ingenuity, and more imaginative ghoulish ghastliness than any of its successors. If you haven't seen it before, you're in for a treat. If you have, this is a moment to place Nosferatu in the context of 1922 as part of this series. Thank you very much indeed.